Hello friends, uh, I'm Piali, your host, and uh, I welcome you all to this session, this webinar. Today we have uh, Mr. Shane Hesty with us from New Zealand. Shane is the director of Agile Learning Programs at IC Agile, International Consortium of Agile. And today uh, Shane will be talking about being agile in a remote team. So he will tell us about how to maintain the collaboration teamwork and live with the agile values in an organization with uh, remote teams. Regarding the format of the session, uh, as you know, it's a one hour of session total. Shane will be presenting uh, about 40, 45 minutes initially and towards the end, he will take care of the questions. You all can post your queries in the chat box. You can type your questions, whatever questions you are having in your mind and Towards the end, Shane will be taking care of those questions. So yeah, that's all from my side. Over to you, Shane, and uh, I would request you to take the show forward. Great, thank you very much. Good evening from here in New Zealand. Good afternoon to you all in India, and uh, good day to people around the rest of the world. Welcome, thank you very much for taking time out of your, your day to uh, come and listen and to come engage with me today. So, um, as was said, I am the Director of Agile Learning Programs for the International Consortium for Agile, uh, IC Agile, and IC Agile is a remote distributed organization. So the, this is not just theory, this is um, the practice of what does this mean for us uh, in our own organization. But I'd like to start by exploring what you know or what are you aware of about um, remote organizations and, and remote teams? What are some of the, the common myths? And we've prepared a poll to explore that. So let's, uh, let's go straight into the poll and you should be able to respond to that. Uh, yes, I'm launching the first poll. Uh, which of these statements are true about remote teams? Yeah. I have launched it one minute and I'm closing the poll now. Here is the result. Uh, so sure, should I uh, read out the poll result for you? If you would be so kind. Sure. Uh, so we have a 49% vote for option A. Remote teams are less productive than co-located teams. 29% for option E, remote teams are unable to become high performing. 41% we have, remote teams are overwhelmed with email. And 12% uh, is there, remote teams can't work in an agile way. And 7% are saying remote teams can't be innovative. Okay, so a lot of people feel that remote teams can be innovative and that uh, remote teams can work in an agile way. Well, that's good because that's my premise. So let's see what the what the second poll is, which is about the um, myths and facts of remote workers. Uh, yeah, so I'm just launching the second poll. Yes. Here is the poll result. So we have the highest number for option E. 64% have voted for remote team members are lonely. Wow. Next, we have 48% for option B. Remote team members are less committed. 36% mm -hmm. are saying remote team members don't care about each other. Then we have uh, 16, 16, both the options, 16%. Remote team members uh, spend all day in their, uh, like, time watching Netflix. And remote team members spend all the day in their pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only that was true. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll explore some of these ideas as we, as we continue and look at... Uh, what are, what are some of the realities? Now, I'm going to say that my, my uh, premise is that none of those things are actually true. Remote teams 
can be effective. Remote teams can have great social environments. Rem remote teams do and can care deeply about each other, but it doesn't just happen. We have to put effort into it. So let's talk about what some of the things are that lead up to this. And we're looking at this in terms of agile as a, as a way of working. So what you see in front of you is the manifesto for agile software development. And I want to pull out and highlight some of the, the uh, values of the manifesto the, that explicitly seem to mitigate against working effectively in remote teams. Uh, we want individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We want close co customer collaboration. Surely we need to be in person to have that. The, the, the 17 people who wrote the manifesto, they were in person when they did it. If we look deeper at the principles behind the Agile manifesto, now, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. Well, is that possible with remote teams? The most efficient and effective method of conveying information within in, uh, and to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. So these are all things that have given rise to the the perception that remote teams can't be agile, that remote teams uh, have all sorts of, of challenges. And there are examples where remote teams do. And uh, just to fill things out, I'm showing the rest of the Agile Manifesto as well. And strangely enough, none of the others, none of the other uh, principles explicitly seem to say that we have to be together to do this stuff. And the, the key is never taking a sing, one of the practices, one of the, the agile frameworks that was designed for face-to-face -face collaborative teams and adopting it and just saying, right, now we'll use this in a um, remote team fashion. We have to adapt the process to the needs of the people. So if people aren't physically in the same place, what do we do to get the same type of presence that uh, is, is needed for that deep collaboration? Uh, an example um, for, for in my own experience was a large, was, was a team within a large organization that was split between Brisbane and Bangalore. And they were a cross-functional, agile, collaborative team. And different skill sets were in different parts of the world. Um, but it wasn't, both of the, both of the locations were cross-functional. There were uh, product owners in both spaces. There were developers, there were testers, there were uh, engineers, there were architects spread between the two locations. It wasn't as if the, that they were outsourcing some of the, one of the silos of skills to, to one location or another. This was a cross-functional collaborative team who were working together. Now, time zones mitigated against them to a certain extent. So the, the team looked at ways we can find more overlap. Some, some days they would start early or end late. Some team members shifted their time a little bit. They invested in technology and in fairly expensive technology for the time. This is, this is five, six years ago. Um, but they had a high bandwidth communication link between the two offices. They had a, a big screen television and a high resolution camera in each office. And they positioned them such that they, the, the cameras looked out over the, the space where the, other, where the other part of the team was working. So you could sit in, in an office in Bangalore, glance up and see the camera, uh, see the screen 
that would show what your colleague in Brisbane was, were they at their desk? You couldn't see their screens, you couldn't see what they were doing, but you had that, that sense of presence. They used um, tools, a, a, a chat tool that enabled them to, to ping each other frequently. But they had a protocol as a team. What they would do, if they had a question, if they needed to talk to each other about something, they wouldn't send an email. They, they would ping each other on the, on the chat tool, and then the two people who needed to have the conversation, or more than two if needed, would get up and go and stand in front of that big screen TV. And it was positioned such that it felt almost like you were in the same space. It was big enough that you, you had that, that sense of presence, and they would have the conversation in front of the screen. They would follow it very often with a, a confirmation by email or something like that, but their, their social protocol, their social contract said, we will talk first, and then follow up by email. Um, another thing that that organization did that was really effective was they made sure that every member of the team had spent time in the other locations so that they knew each other as people. So they, they understood the social bonds that were important for, for, for team formation and that and they put that in place. I've actually participated in a, a meal where they moved the desks up in front of those TVs and had them together, and it looked like it was one long table. And they went to the extent of sharing the recipe and preparing the same food. For one group it was dinner, for the other it was lunch. But they were sharing food together, and it was almost invisible the fact that they were working across thousands of kilometers of distance because that presence felt so so close and that's one example of adapting the process to the needs of the people um, for our own organization we don't have a daily stand-up but we do have a daily huddle we <laughs> we're all remote so it does feel kind of strange to stand in front of the of the laptop, but we all sit and and sometimes that's uh, out in uh, if there's an internet problem at home, one of the one of my co colleagues or uh, will go to a local internet cafe or to to a coffee shop um, and make sure that we we have the the technology the the the, the connectivity that is needed. Um, so don't adopt any of the practices, any of the frameworks without considering how does this need to, to be adapted to the needs of this remote and distributed group. Just taking the Scrum framework and say, we'll do Scrum exactly out of the box or any other framework is not going to work for your distributed team. You have to sit down with the team and figure out what are the, what are the nuances of the ways that we want to work. Hence the, the idea of the plan, do, check, act, use the retrospective, adjust and adapt. And then you can get, my premise is, and my experience is that you can get a lot of benefits of being in remote teams. And here I would like to turn this back to, to you as the audience. And I would ask you, we haven't got a poll for this, but I would ask you to put things into the chat window. What do you feel are the benefits of remote teams or are there any? You know, feel free to say there are none if that's, if that's how you feel. So we'll take a couple of minutes and let's see what people put into the chat window. Okay, so people are sharing their views and uh, I'm assigning those to you. Just do let me know if you can see the points. Uh, well, I don't see them. Um, uh, where should it be coming up? Under question? Oh, there, there I see. Uh, can you see it now? 
Is it coming up under questions? Yeah, questions only. Yeah. Yeah, there we are. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, sharing of best practices, got diversity, distraction free time, hiring the best people no matter where they are. The saving the, the cost saving of office premises. Diversified culture. Yep. People who prefer to work alone. So again, allowing that diversity of um, personality and viewpoint and preferred way of working. Just about the eagerness to cross question as they don't get a chance to have great bonding so that um, perhaps the if I'm reading that correctly it's the, the the fact that our time is valuable with each other getting to know people from different parts of the world yeah so these are the points uh, we, we had from different people. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, we'll stop at that point. <coughs> Feel free to carry on putting on, carry on putting ideas in, folks. Mm -hmm. But here are some that we've that that I have experienced and that we see. Now get the right people, irrespective of their location. It it frees us up. Um, I'm going down to a town of the the bottom of New Zealand in a few weeks for a conference at a place called Dunedin and Dunedin is one of the most isolated cities um, but a beautiful environment and there are thousands of people who work from Dunedin to for organizations all around the world and they choose to live in this at the bottom of the of the South Island of New Zealand very very isolated space People are more engaged. There's actually studies that show people who have more freedom are more engaged. And in the in the remote works by workplace, there there is almost by definition more freedom. The, the and that br does and has been shown to bring uh, higher productivity. And when your organisation is uh, working in a global way. The ability to have people in different time zones or people that can cover different time zones. So in my own case, I live in New Zealand, but I tend to be a bit of a night owl. So I'll do things in my evenings, which means it's easy for me to contact colleagues in Europe and, and in places like India, because the, towards their morning, afternoon, I'm still awake and up and about. But early in the morning in New Zealand, I'm not particularly um, <laughs> that great. So um, I'm a, I've got the flexibility to work in my own time and the the flexibility around the demands of family and life. Uh, over the last year, my wife has been quite ill, and I've been able to to literally be here um, almost all the time to look after her to. Um, I can take time out to take her to doctor's appointments and so forth, and there's no impact. And I've got that that true flexibility. And now uh, I mentioned the adapting to your own pro productivity pro profile, but also being conscious of your, your colleagues' needs. So we have uh, in IC Agile a number of uh, collaborative sessions that we schedule each week, and we move those around so that no, not one person is ever feeling all of the time zone play, pain. We're sharing that very consciously and deliberately. The quiet time for, for deep thinking and, and being able to get into that flow state. And yeah, the no commute is a wonderful thing. Uh, the commute to my office, which you see behind me, is 12 steps. It is outside of my house, though. We actually have a 
small sleep out that has been turned into an office and it's that's quite an important move i go out of the front door and i'm and i come into the office so the mental shift for me is quite important but the other thing about it is i can work from wherever i want to and need to so um i have grandchildren who live in australia and if my wife and i decide we want to go and spend a week or so with them we'll, we can up sticks we can move and stay there with them for a week but i can carry on working and have no impact on on my colleagues and and have very little uh, impact on the flow of work so the the reality is that there's a lot of benefits and these are individual organization and they have been backed up by quite a lot of good research that shows these these stats and this quote from brian de Haaf, simply put remote work is the opportunity to do your best work from anywhere great achievements are measured by outcomes not places but there's a caveat here this means at a leadership level at a management level people need to accept that we're measuring the outcome of work not the activities of work and this is perhaps where my story of how we work at ic agile so let's start with who is ic agile we're the international consortium for agile we are a global certification and accreditation body oh, the whole the organization is um the the, the full-time team is quite small and we are completely distributed around um the the core team well we'll see in a, in a few minutes i've got a map um but we're completely distributed and then we work with organizations all around the world people like izenbridge uh produce uh, they, they teach classes which are accredited by the international consortium for agile and their students get certified what is really really important to help keep alignment with people is a clear compelling vision so within the a remote organization it's really important that everyone understands why they're doing what they do so for us we have this mission statement to advance the state of agile learning globally that is why ic agile exists the things that we do support this but fundamentally this is why we exist as an organization to improve to raise the quality bar and to ensure that people who are learning about agile are learning good stuff so that's and every one of us on the team knows what this mission is and we align with it we care about it we we've had lengthy conversations about what does this mean you know one of the one aspect is certification but certification is the happy side effect our goal is the the learning outcome our goal is not to get more certifications our goal is to get more educated people who really understand what it means to be agile Oops. um i just thought i'd put that up there because this, this is the way the world map was supposed to have been uh, I am. I live in New Zealand, so we're actually at the top of the world, not the bottom of the world. So this is the correct map, but we'll look at the one that most people are used to. And here is where our core team is located. You can see me uh, over in the bottom right-hand corner. We have a cluster of people in North America and one chap in Central America. So that's the core team. When we start to extend that into our uh, the the extended team people who work closely with us in things like accreditations uh, and um, de helping support our partners it gets a little bit wider uh, we have colleagues I have a colleague in Australia as well so he's the closest to me in time zone then when we add our IC agile member organizations suddenly we're talking to a much much bigger picture uh, we have 110 member organizations 
and uh, I can't remember exactly how many countries they're in, but it's a fairly significant proportion of the world. And then when we add ICHR certified professionals, 80,000 people in 110 countries around the world. So that's what it means for us to be a, a global distributed organization. Yes, there's the core team, but there's also the this large community, global community that we work with and support. And uh, we, we collaborate with them, we communicate with people from most of these countries on a very regular basis. But to do that needs tools and, and ways of working. Um, I've put up here some of the tools that we actually use. Not because uh, this is an advertisement for a tool supplier, but just these are ones that we have found work well. And the, the key to is that you need tools that give these capabilities. One of them, one of the, the capabilities is a good video conferencing capability. You need to be able to see your colleagues. It's not good enough to, uh, to just have an audio link the, the, the communication that happens with a, with a video link is really important. You want some way of showing presence, and a tool like Sococo is very good for that. It provides the concept of virtual offices, and at a glance, I can see where, where my colleagues are if they're in their office or, and, and what their status is. they simple do not disturb or I'm away or I can be disturbed, but I'm focusing on something, or yeah, I'm just available for you to chat with if you need to. Uh, you can, we can actually use that, that tool, and there are others like it, to have a quick chat in a space. And then the more asynchronous communication tools, um, something like Slack, we use Slack extensively, uh, but it, it's again, it's an example of an asynchronous chat school chat tool. There are many different ones out there, but you need something with that sort of capability. And then for the longer term artifacts, you want tools that enable collaborative work. And in our situation, we use Google Docs and and the the Google Office suite very extensively. We will frequently, um, two of us go into, two or more of us actually, go into a single document and we'll pair edit it and we'll simultaneously edit it. So we'll have a video chat going and be typing in the same document. And it feels like we're in the same physical space. You, you don't notice that difference in the, in the, the distance and, the, and in the time zones. Um, being conscious of people's time and being aware of not just the time zones, but people's preferred working times is another very, very important aspect. Um, and then we do things like get together. This is a, the photograph that is there is when we had a team event in, in Chicago. We, got, we all got together and we had fun. And that's really important is as a team, you're able to get together and build those social bonds. There's a lot of evidence that uh, teams need to physically get together about once every three to four months. There's the concept of a well of trust and it's about 12 weeks deep. What happens is if you have spent time with somebody, you, you've, you've filled up that well of trust. And then when you go back to your remote location, the next morning or the next day, you get an email. And if there's no other context to it, when you, when you read an email, and we all do this, when you read the email, you hear the person's voice in your head or how you perceive that person's voice. And if, you have, if your well of trust is, is deep and full at that stage, then the, the voice that you hear is the positive, smiley, happy, friendly voice. If you have no other interaction with that person, and six weeks later you get another email, the voice that you hear is totally neutral. And then 
another six weeks goes by and you and you have no further interaction, the voice that you hear is an attack. They're cross, they're annoyed. So you could read exactly the same words and get completely different impressions just because you've lost that will of trust. So with remote organizations, it's really important to find ways to fill that well of trust. One of the ways is to get together, to physically get in the same place and uh, do some, some really important work together. Not and as well as have fun, but the important work is, is an important aspect of building that to those team bonds and creating the um the right culture other sorts of tools that you want to some sort of task and activity activity tracking tool that makes again your the work visible to the whole team but up the, the photograph up there on the on the top right of my screen is one of the things that we did in that session in chicago and we came up at with what we called our culture book and this was a conscious and deliberate choice to decide how we wanted to work together, who we wanted to, how, what we wanted to present ourselves as to the world and to each other. We got to know each other well, and we, we spoke about our values, our, our uh, core motivations, why, we be, why we'd chosen to work for the organization, what we wanted to, to the change we wanted to, to see in the world. Um, because we are, we, we all feel that IC Agile is a purpose-driven organization. And we've distilled that into what we call our culture book. And it's 10, 12 pages long that has got things that we agree to and ways that we choose to work. One example is there is that when we interact with each, with each other, we consciously choose to believe that if each other is coming from a place of good intent. So if um, the wording of an email might seem strange, we've got to first stop and say, this person has a strong positive motivation. They're not trying to attack me, they're trying to help. Now let me read that email with that lens and those were some of the things that we consciously spoke about and here are the the sort of preface to to what we see what we how we see ourselves a small team of fearless leaders who like to punch above our weight class you know we're we're a eight people working for 80,000 people and increasing that that community we view failing as an important muscle for our growth, growth and holds ourselves hold ourselves accountable without placing blame on each other on, on others when we fail. So mistakes happen. We know that failure is an important part of growth. One of the the key aspects of the of the growth mindset and the agile mindset is that ability to learn, and we accept that, and we consciously refuse to place blame. When we work with each other, we find ways to make sure our daily impact is felt, especially important because we're a distributed team. We value and we welcome feedback and trust that it comes with good intentions. We debate, we don't discourage. We create fun and laugh together to exercise our, our creative muscle and to strengthen, strengthen our relationships. One of my colleagues' dogs went in and had to have a, a minor surgery this week. Everybody was sending get well notes for Jackie's dog. The other two of the colleague, two of my colleagues have, have dog, dogs as well, and their dogs sent Jackie's dog a get well note. And it's this consciously taking the time to care about each other. Now we know in co-located teams that happens naturally. In distributed teams, it's harder. So you've got to actually consciously put effort into it. And that's one of the key things about creating an effective distributed team is you have to be prepared to put that little bit of extra effort in. You can't be sloppy and lazy about it. You've actually got to th stop and think, okay, how can I, I know that Jackie is 
a little bit worried about her dog. How can I make her day a bit better? What is the, the small thing I can do that will improve things for her? In terms of our community, we listen, we learn, and we look to advance the state of agile learning globally. We deliver value service, not valet service. We're too small to have a custom tailored option for every one of our, uh, our member organizations or for every one of our um, certificate holders. There's just not enough bandwidth. So we, we consciously look at what's the best value service we can provide. And how do we celebrate? Our bar is high, we reward the extraordinary, and we also celebrate the failures. And we consciously do this. And we have, we schedule time to, to one, have team retrospectives on a regular basis, but also to just have fun together. At least every once a month, sometimes twice a month, we have a session that we call a team coffee break. And in the coffee break, we pick a theme and each person gets to pick a theme and we talk about, and we do, we'll go and get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or a beverage of joy, choice and sit in front of the, of the screens and we, we switch on the video conferencing and we all share our anecdotes and our stories, sometimes it's um, well, what was your most interesting holiday or and, and it, it goes into these these lovely rambling conversations where we do build up that will of trust, consciously putting time aside to create that that safe space. And the key to it is this concept of safety. This this work comes from Google's project Aristotle. And they found that the single most important factor for, cre for great teamwork was not physical location, was not skills, but it was to do with the psychological safety in that team. The feeling that the people who, I'm, who are part of my team, irrespective of distance and location, the feeling that these people care about me and have got my back. They will support me. They will help me. They will encourage me. That was the single most important factor for, for teamwork. And the, the, the Google have published all of this research and made it freely available through their rework with Google uh, community groups. So, that's the IC Agile story, but now let's turn this concrete. What are some, some concrete things that we can do to actually create that environment will, that will enable high-performing Agile teams, even in remote environments? So the first and foremost advice for leaders is start with trust. Work from the premise that the people want to do a good job, that remote teams spend their time in their pajamas and watching, watching Netflix. No, it doesn't happen that way. And believe that your people want to do a great job. Put in place metrics that matter. It's not how many hours did you work. It's not how many um, keystrokes did you type. It's what is the outcome and how have those outcomes supported the organization's goals. Put in place the technology, the tools, buy the licenses, make sure that everyone has the, the right bandwidth, uh, for instance. Uh, high bandwidth matters today. Um, decent laptops, decent equipment. Make sure that everyone has a video camera. And consciously design into the flow of work the social bonding. Allow that time. So our concept of the, of the team coffee break that we do at least once a month, very often twice a month, but also Almost every day, we're having some simple conversation that if you were in the same office, 
would be happening at the water cooler anyway, or in the kitchen. And do lots of experiments. Make that, that learning muscle work hard. Try new things. If it doesn't work, fine. Try something else. If it does work, what can we do to leverage that? So allow the creativity of the people on your teams to come into actually making their environment better for them to work. So that was advice for leaders, advice for teams. Hold each other to account. Make sure your bar is high, but do this without blame and without attack, but in a supportive way, but hold each other to account and hold yourself to account. Accept that different is not wrong. It's just different. And that's often one of the hardest things. And, and when we work cross-culturally, take the time to understand each, other, each other's culture. Build in those water cooler moments, the, the, the coffee breaks, the chats. Get to know each other. There's an idea and there's an InfoQ podcast that I did with um, Andrea Golay and Scott, and I cannot remember his last name, but they spoke about how the, in order to clearly indicate what, what level of, in, of intensity somebody is concentrating at, they, use, they, they, they borrowed from the movie Inception, how many in, layers deep are you? So it's about, are you interruptible? And this is where the tools that show presence and interruptibility really, really help. Respect people's time, but also as a, a, from a, a respect your colleagues need to, to need to communicate with you. Establish these team norms. Spend the time talking about, you know, what, are, what is our normal time for the daily stand-up? or the, the daily huddle, as we call it in our case. Um, what, are the, what are people's preferred working styles? What are their preferred communication styles? So establish these, write them down, but write them down on a whiteboard with, a, with a, a marker so that you can erase it and change it, or in an electronic document, it's not cast in stone. Adapt them as needed. Think about the different types of interactions that you have. Some things need an immediate response. Others can wait. Email for us is a deliberately slow communication method. If I send an email, the, the um, underlying message within the IC Agile team is, this is something I need you to look at at some point. It doesn't need to be immediate but sometime with probably within the next 12 to 24 hours, it would be good if you could look at that and then we'll often, often put in there as well when we need a response by. So make that very, very clear. Whereas if I, if I have a, a question that needs an immediate answer, I will send a, a chat, probably a Slack message, uh, or I'll use Sococo and check to see if somebody's in their office and I might go and you, you can knock on their door and say, hey, can we have a quick chat? And deliberately look out for those opportunities to build the social bonds. When you do come together as a team, one of the things that's really important to do is to share food. Because human beings are social animals. And that, and that sharing of food is one of the strongest bonding techniques and builds that, that trust that is so important for teams. And the advice for individuals, well, hold yourself to account. Be disciplined. Communicate, don't assume. Share your context, share, indicate your mood. Start from that place of trust and good intent and query intent, be able to ask each other this, what, were, what was in this email felt to me like you were challenging something that I'd done. Was that your intent? And have that safety to explore that together. Practice empathy. Think about, you know, what's happening with this person at that time. 
get to know how each other likes to communicate and use that as your default. Be very, very clear when you communicate time, time zone, what days. Uh, for me in New Zealand, I'm always a day ahead of most of my colleagues in, in the USA. And when we talk about you know 9 a.m., whose 9 a.m. is that? Because if it's your 9 a.m., that's 2 o'clock in the morning for me. No, thanks. If possible, have a space that isn't your bedroom to work in. Um, you want that the being able to see the, the distinction between home and work. And for me, being able to come out to this office is, is really important. The professional appearance, don't go to work in your pajamas. Uh, but also, and this is something that uh, I've had to be very conscious of, it's easy to get so involved in the work and be being busy and, and communicating and collaborating with people that you don't take enough breaks. So I set my alarm and I, I take a lunch break every day. I go, uh, I'm learning Tai Chi and I do practice. I don't do it as frequently as I should. But I take the time out and consciously look to take, take care of, of your health and your well-being, mental health, physical health. And, yeah, get to know each other. Take the time to understand and to build that, that teamwork. So my feeling and my experience is that remote agile teams work. But they take work. They take work from the individual. They take work from the team. They take support from the organization. They don't just happen. But that's also true of effective co-located teams. Most of the advice that I've got here for, for teams, for individuals and for organizations, actually applies whether or not you are remote. Because great teamwork happens when people take the time and the effort to really respect, trust, and support each other. So that's my premise. So at this point, yeah, any questions? Oh, yeah, just uh, let me check the question box. <coughs> yes, uh, we do have a uh, few questions here. So the first mm -hmm. question I can see, what is the role of an agile coach with remote teams and what all challenges he or she faces in uh, distributed teams? So the role of the agile coach in a remote team is largely the same as the agile coach in a co-located team to provide a guidance and support and to create a safe space for that team to be effective in. But in the distributed team, that safe space is a virtual space. So as an agile coach, uh, as a coach on a distributed agile team, I would want to have regular interactions with the team as a group, but also individually with the team members. And I would be looking at their individual health and safety and how and do they feel supported do they feel engaged do they feel encouraged and if not i'd be working with them to to overcome that feeling of isolation that is one of the risks of being in a, in a remote team but but really the good coaching competencies still apply irrespective Okay, so moving on to the next one. Uh, next, we have uh, how do you encourage uh, remote teams to have a collaborative culture? Ideally, you bring them together and you ask them to consciously design that culture. To take the time to sit down, to brainstorm, to, to discuss what culture do we want to have? And then to, to produce something like that culture book that I mentioned. For us, that has become a, a set of guidelines that, talks about, that talk about some of the, the key things in terms of 
how we interact with each other, how we interact with the outside world, how we interact with the different stakeholders uh, in the IC Agile community, um, what, what good is. We have a clear definition of done for all of our tasks. Um, we use a, a Kanban process for, for tracking work. Every every card on that board will, and the, it's a virtual board. Every card on that board is visible to everyone, and it has a clear definition of done. It has a clear owner. Um, we typically do put in uh, intended uh, end dates on them. We measure through. We measure uh, the the flow. So we look at the things things like the cumulative flow di diagram and so forth, and we explore that. Um, but really, to build a, a, a collaborative culture requires people to take the time to choose to be collaborative. If you can do this face to face, it will be easier. Not crucial, but definitely easier. Okay, okay. So, yeah, next we have uh, what about when the time zone offset is uh, 12 hours or more? then you have to take turns sharing the time zone pain. So don't make it all one member of the team's pain. So I, I live in New Zealand. I'm the remote, most remote from the rest of the team. I don't always do the 7 o'clock in the morning or the, the sometimes I, we have had meetings that have been at 6 o'clock in the morning. But very often... Jackie, who's at the other, who's on the east coast of the USA, she will stay late to, so that I don't have to be there very early in the morning. So we choose to to trade off the time zone pain and take turns, share the pain. Don't don't make it one person's. Uh, don't make one person the victim of time. Yeah. And also find you know ways to to adapt how much time do you need the overlap to be yes definitely definitely okay i'm moving to the next question shane uh, next we have uh, what if you can't get people together uh, how do you build a social bond uh, that is needed to become a performing team um it's harder, but then what you've got to do is have a good video conferencing capability, have a tool perhaps like the, the Contenio shared whiteboard type environment, um, Luke Holman's collaborative games tools. There are, there are a, a number of them out there where you can do a remote-based brainstorming session, putting ideas up, sharing them, even to the point of virtual sticky notes, post-it notes. You need something like that. You need to put, to set aside a block of time and to have somebody facilitate the conversations and get let the team still have those collaborative conversations. It's harder if you're not together. It's not impossible by any means. Okay, I'm moving to the next question. Uh, next, we have how to make the retrospective more interactive or productive uh, with the remote team members. This is where the collaborative tools really help. Um, I we, we sometimes use that Contenio product I mentioned. That What that does is it gives you a, a whiteboard space, and you can put images on there. So... One of the um, common views of a retrospective, one of the common techniques for the retrospective is the sailboat technique. Well, in, the, in that Contenio tool, they have a sailboat image. And you allow the team to, to put their virtual post-it notes. So what's holding us back? Are these are the anchors. What's pushing us forward? This is the wind in your sails. What are the reefs that we want to avoid? The risks and what does the um, tropical island look like 
this is the the palm trees and so forth and you put your virtual post-it notes and you run your retrospective using these virtual tools and then you allow people to to have the collaborative conversation as well so the tools do help they are a lot better today than they were even five years ago okay so can a uh, scrum master work remotely uh, we have the next question the role of the scrum master is, is to support the team so we because we use kanban we don't have a scrum master role on our team um the scrum master responsibilities are spread across the whole team and if we think about the work of the scrum master about 12 percent of their time is facilitating the scrum ceremonies that can be spread across anybody in the team then the other aspects of the scrum master are removing obstacles and supporting providing that process guidance for the team well, there is no reason why that can't be done with a remote team. If most of the team is co-located and the Scrum Master is remote, that's gonna be, gonna be harder. If all of the team members are remote, then, then we're all at an even keel. But if you have the Scrum Master out in one place and then the rest of the team co-located, that Scrum Master will have to have have to be virtually present with that team almost all the time that the team is busy. So they will have to, if they're in a different time zone, they're gonna to have to shift their time to match up with that team. Is the role of the Scrum Master is to, is to remove obstacles, provide guidance and support the team. So they must be responsive to the team very, very quickly. They can't be unavailable to the team or shouldn't be unavailable to the team. The, the remote, the fully remote team, yes, any member of the team can be the Scrum Master. Okay, so last question and then uh, we'll wrap up the session. So here we have a how to manage conflicts in remote agile team. Cool. <laughs> How do you manage conflicts in any team? Uh, you use your conflict management skills, but you've got you start with that culture of trust and safety. So start from the point of view that every behavior is a good intent. The people who are involved in the conflict aren't trying to be difficult, but there is something going on that is causing them stress. And this is where, there, as a team, now we want to explore how can we make things better? How can we remove the obstacle that is causing the stress? Is it something to do with, this, with the, the system we are working within? Is it the nature of our tools? Is it the work that we are doing? What is causing the stress? What's causing the conflict? And then we work to address the conflict. But again, we come back to that culture of start with good intent and practice empathy. Believe that everybody has the intent to do a really good job and they want to, to be engaged and that we care about each other. Then we can have the conversation. We can explore the conversation and tools like, like clean language and um, the core protocols maybe techniques that we can bring into the team to learn how to use these tools. And this is a, a, a coaching um, responsibility to bring, to help bring these tool, these tools and these techniques into the, into the team. And then we can use that to, to explore the, the source of the conflict. And in many ways, it's the same as dealing with conflict in a co-located team but start from good intent, practice empathy, and believe that the, the people who are in conflict are not doing it out of any malice, 
but they are they want to do a good job and have a good outcome okay yeah that's that's a great way to handle the things in uh, nice and said so we have come to the end of our session thank you all for joining uh, attending this session will earn you one pdu and one seu seu under category a and pdu under leadership category claiming uh, those seus and pdus all the details you will get in next one hour of time you will receive an email from our side and you will have all the details and if you have any follow up query we know uh, like there were few questions we were not able to take care uh, due to the time boxing thing there will be one thread of the discussion forum you can post your queries there any question any follow up doubts you have and uh, shane can take care of those questions yeah and uh, next webinar is on 16th of may peter stevens uh, would be the speaker and the topic would be personal agility so yeah that's all from today's session thank you shane for this wonderful session thanks for your time thank you very much yeah and thank you all once again for joining us today thank you